famous New York um, Union Station. So it's a beautiful architecturally uh, very interesting building and I encourage you to see it. Um, Winnipeg is the first city in the world to develop the 911 emergency system. I didn't know that, but now I do. Um, and currently there's seven finalists for the world's most intelligent cities and Winnipeg's one of the finalists for that. Um, so hopefully we can uh, um, get on top. Uh, the Rinne we're very proud of the Royal Winnipeg Ballet, um, which is the oldest ballet in Canada and the second oldest in North America. It's very well established and um, um, I would encourage you to learn more about it. And did you know that James Bond is a Winnipegger? That actually the, the real life character that James Bond was based on is Sir William Stevenson, um, the man called Intrepid, and he's a, a diminutive little five foot five Winnipegger who went on to do things like develop the CIA and uh, help develop the CIA and uh, form Camp X where um, military uh, intelligence officers were trained. So when you think of spies, you know, of course you're gonna think of Winnipeg. <laughs> so that's not all. When you think of uh, uh, beautiful dancing and culture, when you think of excellent uh, athletes, when you think of celebrity, um, innovations in safety and security, when you think of beautiful architecture and cute lovable characters, and international men of mystery and women of mystery, then of course I hope the first thing that comes to your mind is Winnipeg. So welcome to everyone from your host city. <laughs> also, another fun fact, did you know that this is the 25th anniversary of, uh, of CAR? Um, so I'd like to congratulate CAR and uh, on its 25th anniversary and thank all the leadership throughout the years for um, uh, really guiding this organization and all of the conference organizers over the years. So congratulations to CAR. So this year's conference theme is realizing our potential, local to global and back. There have been incredible advances in the field of HIV with continued global efforts with improved prevention, treatment, and care. Now is the time to build on these efforts to more fully and effectively realize our potential. Lessons generated in Canada from our HIV research community have important implications for many settings around the world, and these need to be shared. Similarly, there's significant knowledge globally that we need to examine and apply here in Canada. Working together, working across disciplines, across provinces, and across countries, we can mobilize our knowledge and our understanding and improve our impact. We think that we've got an exciting conference lined up, and I'd like to take a moment just to highlight a few uh, points to note about this year's conference. So last night, there was a first annual Car Hockey Cup. <laughs> For those that are... And this year we're holding a number of multidisciplinary se sessions that'll take place on Saturday morning. And the idea behind these sessions are to give people an opportunity to share, to listen, and to learn from colleagues that are working in an area other than their own, and to foster future collaborations, to break out of our typical track silos and to really listen and share. As well, this year during the poster presentations, each track has selected a few authors that'll present their posters and have uh, what we hope and, and believe to be important and, and uh, stimulating discussion. Great. So it um, took a lot of work to put this conference together like it does every year. And we'd like to especially thank the um, Scientific Program Committee, whose names you see up there. Uh, everyone works really hard. That's our track chairs um, and uh, especially the car office and Peter Sky, who really helped put, uh, put this together. So thanks to the Scientific Program Committee. <laughs> Congratulations also to a number of scholarship recipients, um, the 2016 Academic, Vaccine, and Community Scholarship winners. So congratulations to all those people. Okay, 
So I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Ken Casper, Director of the Manitoba HIV Program. Ken is a good friend and colleague. He's an amazing clinician, and he's been an incredible leader for our program here in Manitoba, and I'm very pleased to welcome up, up to the stage. Thanks and uh, welcome. Uh, um, I do want to just reiterate that the CAR conference is taking place in the original lands of the Ashinabeg, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Metis Nation, in which I'm personally a member. We respect the treaties that we were made on these territories. First, I want to welcome you to the silver anniversary of CAR taking place here in Winnipeg. Uh, it's been 14 years since it was last in Winnipeg and six years since it was last on the Canadian prairies. Lots has changed in this time, especially in the province of Manitoba. We started the journey of the Manitoba HIV program in 2007. Currently, it's a centralized program in Winnipeg, has a partnership between Nine Circles and the Health Science Center. We've been expanding our partners here in Winnipeg and outside our big city. With one example that I'd like to announce, the future development of a Brandon HIV clinic, which will be starting in September of 2016. And we've been working on this for many years, and we're very excited about having a Brandon HIV clinic. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll get a chance to take in uh, some of the sites and the great restaurants here in Winnipeg while you're here. Um, we love our city. Uh, I'm very sorry about the weather. It was actually plus 35 on last Thursday, and it's certainly not plus 35 today. The sobering news, of course, is the ongoing uh, Canadian Prairie HIV pandemic that has certainly hit our friends in Saskatchewan, but has also hit here in Manitoba. Both of our provinces consistently are over the expected Canadian average, as you can see on the graph. In Manitoba, it's a grumbling epidemic that shows no signs of declining as of yet. And we now have 1,250 Manitobans in, a, in our clinical care program. When I started in 2007, we had 500 uh, patients in our clinical care program. We can consistently see 30 to 40 percent of our new cases as female, with heterosexual transmission being the most common risk factor. But for the first time in 2015, MSM transmission, which we've noted has been increasing as well, has taken over as the most common risk group. HIV continues to hit the vulnerable populations. Our Indigenous patients are consistently overrepresented in the epidemic here in Manitoba. Indigenous people make up 17% of our Manitoba population, yet anywhere from 25 to 61% of our new HIV cases, depending on the year. This is also echoed in Saskatchewan at even higher rates. We also consistently see 25 to 30 percent of our new patients presenting with CD4 counts below 200, and we continue to see AIDS opportunistic infections in the hospitals and in our clinics. Advocating for expansion and normalization of HIV testing continues to be a major barrier moving forward. Despite challenges, our clinical care program has had some success. This is just a snapshot of success of a care cascade of the last 150 patients diagnosed, representing 2014 and 2015. We've had linkage of over 97% consistently over the past seven years, and continue to have good engagement in viral suppression in the patients in our clinical care program. Of these 150 patients, as you can see on the care cascade, I can tell you that no patient group has left been, uh, been left behind, whether you look at women or indigenous people, in this care cascade, it does not change. We've been having some success due in part to the strong and positive working relationship with primary, tertiary care, public health, and all our community partners and indigenous partners. The big question, of course, going forward is, is it sustainable? Will we achieve the 90-90-90 mandate of the entire HIV population in Manitoba by 2020? Only if these barriers on the slide are addressed Three of them, I feel, are of critical importance, and I hope we can try to have some success by 2020 in these three domains. Number one, we need universal access 
to HIV meds for all Manitobans. No one should be left behind in this pandemic. We need to change HIV testing behavior and healthcare provider testing behavior and the general public so we can try to work on finding those first 90% and prevent missed opportunities and late presentation which continue to happen every day in the healthcare system. And finally, we need to continue keep working on stigma and discrimination and follow through on the 94 calls to action of the truth and reconciliation recommendations for all of our indigenous populations if we're truly gonna have provincial success. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ken. We felt it was really important to have someone from the front lines really come and um, address the conference right from the beginning and no one better than, uh, than Ken. Thanks for your remarks. Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome to the stage um, the president of CAR and professor at Memorial University, Michael Grant. Mike. Thanks, Keith. Uh, thanks, Marissa and, and Ken as well. I'd like to thank the entire local organizing committee and, and all the other groups that have contributed to the, to the program this year to producing a, an incredible program. So much has already happened and we're still just at the, at the opening ceremony. It's, a, it's an honor for me as CAR president to welcome you to, to Winnipeg and somewhat fortunate as well after foolishly taking part in the, in the first CAR Cup. So I'd like to thank the medical staff as well for uh, allowing me to <laughs> remain ambulatory and somewhat ambulatory and take part in the, op in the opening reception. And some of that medical staff is on, is on CAR Council and I'd like to acknowledge CAR Council who have, have worked incredibly hard on a volunteer basis over the last year to run the program that uh, CAR has developed and grown ov over the years and prepare for, th for the annual conference. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. Uh, it goes without saying that the uh, conference couldn't take place without the contribution of, our, of all of our sponsors. Uh, this conference is the premier gathering of HIV researchers in Canada. It brings together people across the four disciplines, academic and community researchers, gives them the chance to exchange uh, uh, their latest research results and their ideas over three or four days of the, of the conference and to develop and appreciate each other's perspectives, uh, hopefully to a greater extent, and to work harder for the next year with new ways of, of researching towards better treatments um, and better prevention of HIV infection. Uh, now I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Mark Wallet. Um, Mark is a professor at Laval University. He's a renowned uh, researcher himself. He's going to bring greetings on behalf of the, of the Government of Canada. Mark is the director of the Institute for Infection and Immunity, and the Institute of Infection and Immunity oversees the Canadian Institute of HIV, or of uh, Health Research, HIV and AIDS Research Initiative. Uh, so welcome, Mark. Merci beaucoup, uh, Michael. Donc, uh, au nom du gouvernement du Canada, c'est un grand plaisir d'être ici aujourd'hui, de rencontrer plusieurs amis, de faire des nouveaux amis. J'étais au, euh, au symposium des nouveaux investigateurs aujourd'hui et c'est euh, très plaisant de voir cette nouvelle génération de chercheurs là, qui vont contribuer à la recherche euh, sur le VIH-Sida. So, as you know, uh, HIV is a priority for the Government of Canada. We have the HIV initiatives, and within this initiative, there's a, a, a specific amount of money, it's $21.5 million a year, that is devoted for research purposes, and this is being managed by CIHR. This has created capacity, it has created excellence, and through the open program also, there's twi between 25 to $28 million a year also uh, invested in uh, HIV research. The spectrum of research that's being funded is very wide from very basic biomedical disco discovery for cure research up to implementation science. There was a symposium this afternoon on uh, implementation science for prevention of HIV 
to community-based research. So it's really a spectrum of research that the government is funding. This research brings a number of discoveries of outcomes that have made huge difference. Uh, I think in Canada, usually uh, HIV AIDS can be manageable. One testimony of this is we had a, a comorbidity uh, initiative and we have consulted experts and people living with HIV AIDS and the priority was aging. I said, well, aging is not a comor comorbidity. They said, yes, but this is now important for the community. And this was really a result of research that led to these, uh, uh, you know, impressive uh, outcomes. But there's still a lot of challenges, whether it's prevention, whether it's biomedical, whether it's behavior, there's a lot of challenges. Stigma is still a huge problem. And we have, and this, there were some examples here about the vulnerable populations also that are struck by HIV AIDS. Donc, je voudrais vous remercier tous pour les efforts que vous faites. C'est les chercheurs académiciens, c'est les étudiants, c'est les stagiaires, c'est les résidents, c'est les chercheurs de la communauté, c'est les chercheurs du gouvernement, mais c'est également les personnes qui vivent avec le VIH-Sida qui font une différence, qui amènent à des nouveaux, une nouvelle dimension pour la recherche. I truly believe that through excellence in research, we can achieve a world without HIV AIDS. To, to finish, uh, CIHR has been on a number of changes in the last few years, but HIV remains a priority. There's new staff, but staff that is dedicated. They are in the room, so we have CIHR as a, as a, as a what? Uh, a booth, thank you. Uh, as a, I'm <laughs> I've been through many, 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 many meetings today. So as a booth, uh, please go and visit them. They're there to help you, and I think it will be uh, very helpful. We have an advisory board uh, called Chirac. Me actually, Michael Grant was a, a chair of Chirac at one point, and uh, I know that I've seen Jonathan Angel that is there, that is also the current chair of Chirac, and I saw many members from the community that are present that help us in moving forward. So I want to reassure you that HIV AIDS is an important priority for CIHR and for Government of Canada. I will finish by wishing, wishing you all the best for this meeting, especially for the ones, and I was sitting this morning with two uh, dynamic young women that it was their first meeting, and I think it's an important event in your career, and please make the best out of it and uh, so that uh, Canadian science makes a difference. Thank you, merci. Thank you very much, Dr. Roulette. So in 2001, as president of CAR, Ken Rosenthal initiated the Mark Weinberg Lecture as a way to honor the veteran leader in the fight against HIV AIDS. The CAR Conference Organizing Committee bestows the honor of the Mark Weinberg Lecture to both honor Dr. Weinberg's ongoing contribution and to recognize the efforts of others in the research community who exemplify the same traits of excellence, perseverance, and commitment to the cause of finding innovative and groundbreaking ways to address the epidemic. It is with great pleasure that I get to introduce the recipient of this year's Mark Weinberg Lecture, Dr. Stephen Moses. Stephen is a good friend, colleague, and mentor. He's currently professor and head of the department at the, of the Community Health Sciences at the University of Manitoba. He is a physician and scientist who has had major contributions globally to understanding biological and behavioral risk factors for HIV infection and translating research findings into practice. He has been at the forefront of investigating and integrating into programs major innovations for HIV prevention, improved management and control of conventional STIs, implementation of focused, peer-mediated peer educational interventions for high-risk populations, and male circumcision for reducing HIV susceptibility among men. Dr. Moses was co-PI on the landmark trial of male circumcision for HIV prevention in Kenya that helped lead to the scale up of medical male circumcision services in Eastern and Southern Africa. 
He's authored over 230 peer-reviewed publications, as well as several monographs and book chapters, and has made numerous presentations at national and international conferences. I first met Stephen when I was a medical student, and he provided an opportunity for me to go and spend the summer in Kenya with the University of Manitoba's HIV program. And that opportunity opened up more doors and more opportunities and shaped the work that I do as a clinician and as a researcher. Stephen has continued to be a mentor and an advisor to me, and I am forever grateful for his friendship, his guidance, and his support. Welcome, Stephen, and congratulations. Uh, thanks very much, Marissa, uh, for those, those generous and kind words. Um, Thanks very much to the car, uh, the car, uh, to car, and to the organizers of the meeting for for awarding me this this honor. Thanks uh, particularly to, to Mark Weinberg uh, for for being here. Mark Mark is, as everybody knows, is one of the giants of the HIV world, not just in Canada but globally. And this is uh, this is quite an honor to be able to be asked to give this talk. Um, I've kind of done, for the title of the talk, uh, I did a little play on words on the conference themes, so calling, I'm calling it local to global and back to the future. Uh, because I, I guess because much of what I'm gonna, most of what I'm gonna say today is, is not new. It's, it's what we've known for 25, 30 years, but we're still learning how we can better uh, Im implement what we know. Uh, there's a conflict of interest disclosure. There's learning objectives, which nobody really reads, so I'll skip that. And uh, I think this is, a, this is a particularly exciting time for, for HIV prevention. Um, there, are some, there are some exciting new HIV prevention technologies which have just come on stream within the past few years. There was a session here earlier on, on, on pre-exposure prophylaxis with antiretroviral drugs. This is, a, this is an area which is really, really, really coming into its own. There are, there are at least 35 demonstration implementation projects ongoing in over 20 countries around the world uh, on, on PrEP, uh, 26 of them involving key populations, either female sex workers, men who have sex with men, or injection drug users. Uh, there's, there's including one that we're involved with in India. Um, treatment is prevention is also, is also uh, exciting new technology, uh, sometimes called uh, test and treat or test and start. And uh, th the rollout is starting uh, in, in many countries, including Canada. Uh, including some uh, some developing countries as well. There, there are several very large popula population-based uh, randomized trials ongoing in Africa to look at uh, look, look, you know, look at how it plays out uh, in terms of HIV prevention at a, at, a, at a large population level, and we're, we're going to be hearing more and more about those. But in the meantime, the, the rollout is, is is already started and will continue. And then male circumcision, which Marissa mentioned, uh, an another new uh, exciting program. Um, and there, but there have been over. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. But there, there have been over 10 million new circumcisions uh, that have, that have been uh, that have been done in over 14 countries, uh, the 14 priority countries in eastern and southern Africa, over the past uh, five or six years. So the, all, all, all these things are um, are um, are really really important and exciting new developments. But I, I'm going to talk about today. What I'm mostly going to talk about today is about um, how these impact on, on key populations. And uh, key populations, sometimes called high-risk populations, formerly most high-risk populations, the, the terminology changes. But I think wh whether it's old technology like condoms or some of these new technologies, I think what, what's criti critical is that they need to reach the populations that are most at risk, most vulnerable, both of acquiring HIV and, tr and transmitting HIV. That may, it may seem obvious, but it's something that uh, it's something that's often that's that's often neglected, and uh, you know I've 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 heard many times people getting up at uh, international conferences and plenaries and saying that there's no need to focus on these populations because everybody's at risk, everybody's vulnerable, and that's usually met with 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 a lot of applause because that sounds egalitarian and kind of an, an equitable thing to say, but HIV transmission is is not egalitarian, it's not equitable. And you know, going back to some of uh, the work of the University of Manitoba group in Kenya in the 1980s and, and 1990s, 
uh, where uh, uh, this focus on key populations has been advocated. Uh, but w whether it has been or not is sort of is sort of up and down. And th this is this is from an old World Bank publication uh, based on some of our work in Kenya. You know w why it's important to focus on key populations. Be uh, and this this is, this is based on some the situation as it, as it was in Nairobi in the 1980s. If you have a, a group of female sex workers who, and at that time, uh, some of some of those groups uh, had 80 percent 80 percent HW prevalence. So if condom use could be increased to 80% in that group, then based on the numbers of partners per day, you could, you could, you could avert uh, 10,000 new infections per year. Whereas a, a similar uh, population of 500 men who were, who, were just, who were a general population, maybe factory, factory workers, you would only uh, avert about 88 infections per year. And uh, this is, this, this con this kind of these kinds of programs can are also very, very cost effective. And you know we we, sh we showed some time ago that uh, you know programs which focus on HIV prevention among these high risk populations would also lead to uh, over time declines in HIV prevalence in the in the general population. And this is again going back about fif fifteen years. So I, I think the interest in work with key populations has kind of waxed and waned. I think we, over the last few years there's been a kind of a revival of interest. For, um, and a, a, a couple of sort of uh, landmarks, I guess. One, one is the Avahan Indian Aj India AIDS Initiative of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which was a which was a five hundred million dollar program over about ten years, which has recently completed uh, been completed in India. Our, our group at the University of Manitoba was the uh, implementing partner for the program in, in Karnataka in South India, in the Karnataka state in South India, and. Uh, that 500 million is really an under underestimate of the total cost of the program because the government of India itself contributed probably double that in terms of uh, programs and services to, to support that initiative. And it was that initiative was really focused on HIV prevention among key populations. And the key populations varied a bit depending on the geographic area, but they usually included uh, sex workers, MSM, um, pe uh, people who inject drugs, and in some places other groups like uh, truckers and other high-risk groups. There's also this uh, relatively new linkages program funded by uh, PEPFAR uh, and under USAID, uh, implemented by H FHI 360, which is a $73 million program over, se over several years. Uh, we're, we're also involved uh, partnering with FHI and some of those uh, uh, linkages uh, prevention programs in Africa and Kenya and uh, several countries in Eastern, Southern and Western Africa. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about the experience in India, because I, I, as really as an example of, of uh, why these kinds of approaches are important. And um, going back around the, the turn of the millennium, there was a lot of concerns about the, how the HIV epidemic was going to play out in Asia. The, uh, the National Intelligence Council, which is a, I think it's basically an arm of the CIA, um, had predicted that. Uh, in India would have about 20 to 25 million HIV cases by 2010, which, which, would, which would be about 5% of all adults. Uh, that turned out not to be the case. Uh, and, uh, but by 2010, there were estimated to be about 2.2 million people in India with HIV. It's now down to, to less than that. Um, uh, still a large number, but India is a very large country, of course, so that, that, that translates to a prevalence that's relatively low. Uh, but the common wisdom then was that a the HIV AIDS situation in Asia was similar to what it had been in Africa 15 to 20 years earlier, and that's, that's clearly not the case, and I think it was based on a, a misunderstanding of the transmission dynamics of HIV, and also to some extent the, the response. And I think uh, what became clear in India early on was that uh, th there was a lot of heterogeneity within the country um, itself, and so a district analysis was critical. There were both 50 high prevalence districts, many of them rural, which had 10% of the national population only, but about 50% of the HIV cases. And uh, there were m many high prevalence districts and they're in three major clusters, which are shown on, on the map. Um, and, and, and really, those it was really important to have kind of a, uh, to develop a focused response to deal with the, uh, to, 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 to invest uh, in resources to deal with, uh, H to, to tackle HIV prevention in those areas where prevalent, where uh, transmission was really was really occurring and was out of control, and uh, we we kind of put our we, we we put our thinking together in this monograph uh, published about ten years ago by the World Bank uh, 
our, our understanding of the approach to HIV, what, what the approach should be to HIV prevention among populations, particularly in, in South Asia. Uh, this is still available online if anybody's interested. But our, the, the approach was basically that in concentrated epidemics, as, as was mostly the case for, for much of Asia, uh, effective focus prevention efforts among the most at-risk populations should have major impact in reducing HIV risk among them and also in the general population, and that was really what was, what was crucially needed. Uh, even in general, uh, generalized epidemics, and the data here are less strong, I, I would say, but even in generalized epidemics, we, we feel that focused prevention efforts among the key populations is still important and necessary, but it's not enough, and additional prevention efforts in the general population are going to be needed. So uh, in, in terms of uh, HIV prevention and sex work in India, uh, HIV transmission in sex work networks was likely to have a substantial impact on the on overall HIV incidence and prevalence. There's a large sex worker population in India, estimated 5 to 15 female sex workers per, per thousand adult men. Uh, HIV prevalence among uh, female sex workers are tenfold greater than that in the general population in, 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 all, in everywhere where you, where, you, where you look for it. So w I think with the, with the few possible exceptions, the sexual structure in India is unlikely to sustain HIV transmission independent of sex work, sex work networks. So our approach was uh, a geographic one to uh, d address the issue of scale at the micro and macro level. So go into a district, identify where the main hotspots were, whether in, in, in cities or in other uh, rural areas, and then within the hotspots to cover all the critical sexual networks with prevention programming. And uh, I think the key strategies, uh, I'll, I'll just touch on this briefly, I think Jamie Blanchard in his plenary session on Saturday on is going is going will talk about this in a little more detail. But our, our approaches were to partner with NGOs that were large and experienced in community development to have strong technical management support, focus on community mobilization and participation, work on the enabling environment, uh, use evidence to guide programming, and and set set ambitious targets and assess progress against them. And th this approach was adopted not just in. Uh, in the state we were working in, in South India, which is in the southwest of the country, but, but, but nationally by the government. So over the course of about 15 years, these what in India are called targeted interventions, for, and this is this in this example for female sex workers, was uh, expanded to cover virtually the, the entire country. Major national effort. And this is the kind of, these are the kind of ways we track the effort. Uh, the curve in red shows um, uh, the total number of uh, sex workers that we're covering in, in, in the Karnataka state in the districts we're working in, about, about 60,000 that we had identified and enumerated. And uh, about uh, of those 60,000, about 50,000 per month were contacted, 50,000 were contacted at least once a month by peer educators, so uh, you know, over 80%. Over and about um, 30 and, um, and about 20,000, or about uh, a third, were uh, w uh, visited, visited the clinic, uh, the, uh, the, the clinic that where, where we provided counseling and education and STD treatments and other things, HIV testing on, on, a, on, a, on, a, monthly, on a monthly basis. And we also made sure that condoms were distributed. The, 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 prevent all the, the only prevention technology that we had during those years was, was, was condoms, and we made sure that, we made sure that and sufficient condoms were uh, prevented to meet the need. We, we estimated an average need of about 32 condoms per sex worker per month. We made sure that those condoms were available and they're also distributed in an equitable way because not everybody, you know, some, some required many more and some less. And I, I, think, I think the results over time were, uh, were, uh, were quite striking. Uh, this slide shows uh, three rounds of integrated behavioral and biological assessment done in five districts in, 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 in Karnataka State, the, in the state we were working in. Uh, they, were, they, they, were, they were done at, about f at five year intervals, so about a 10 year. Uh, Ten-year uh, gap between round one and round three, and overall HIV prevalence among uh, sex workers dropped from 20 percent to about 10 percent, dropped in half. <coughs> and in each of the districts, there was a drop. And some of them, they, there, was dr there was a lot of heterogeneity, obviously, in HIV transmission in, in be between the districts. But in all of them, there was a drop. And some of them, uh, even at the district level, the, the drops were statistically significant. I don't have really time to go into what other things that we did, uh, but we, di we did do a lot of work on the uh, enabling environment, trying to working with police, and, and over time there were declines in uh, reports by female sex workers of, ha of having been beaten or raped in the past year. Uh, this slide just shows two different ways that we measured we measured that, 
uh, between 2006 and 2008. And overall, in the general population, at least as measured by HIV prevalence among antenatal clinic attenders, uh, there, were, there, was a, there were significant declines in HIV uh, prevalence from about 1.5% when we started in 2003, now down to about 0.35%. Uh, so there, there, there have been a number of, uh, there were a number of attempts to estimate uh, the impact of these programs, uh, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, it was not possible to do um, uh, massive uh, randomized trials in India, and I think it's, it's, it's always going to be difficult to, to create this kinds of these kinds of uh, prevention programs. But 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 uh, a, n a number of efforts through you know through modeling and making assumptions about condom use, where were a number of studies were done to estimate the impact. One study by one study done by the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which was an independent study published in the Lancet a few years ago, estimated that 41,000 infections were averted over four years in Karnataka state and about 100,000 in, in the four southern Indian states that were part of the Alahan program. Uh, our, our data, sh we estimated uh, a little bit more numbers of infections in averted. Uh, Pickles uh, and colleagues on a couple of papers in Lancet Global Health a couple few years ago estimated over 200,000 infections averted over four years in the four southern states and uh, 600 over 600,000 uh, infections over a 10-year period. And I think uh, th there's there's data now from uh, from India which shows uh, which shows a, at, a, at a national level what's been going on. So th th this slide shows the numbers of people living with HIV going back to 2007, and there's been steady declines over time from about 2.2 uh, million in 2007 down to around 2.1 million. And this is in the face of this is in spite of treatment being offered, particularly beginning around 2008. So, where, so you'd expect that treatment would have an effect in reducing mortality and, and thereby have a, uh, uh, an effect in increasing prevalence. But in spite of that, the incidence is obviously uh, high enough to be able to counteract that effect. Um, this, this slide also shows prevalence by, uh, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a proportion, also declining. This slide shows trends in HIV infections, so I, I need an, an even more marked decline in incidence, which is what it would have been expected in terms of the uh, uh, going down from about 200,000 estimated cases, uh, new cases per year in 2001 to about 70,000 in 2015. And th this, this, slide sh this slide shows the scale up of ART, which began uh, in, in earnest in around two 2006, 2007, and reach reaching quite high levels by 2013, uh, close to a million people now in India uh, with HIV on treatment. And in spite of that, uh, in spite of, uh, and, and because of that, mortality has decreased, which is what the orange curve shows, but in spite of that, prevalence has, has been decreasing. So just uh, to summarize this sort of portion of the talk, uh, th uh, this, this is a slide from David Wilson at the World Bank. Uh, about the five things that we must do better in concentrated epidemics. Uh, he talks about much better ec epidemic analysis and characterization, both the sources of transmission and the geographic variations. We, we focused on the where, 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 where transmission is, is most, uh, is, is most uh, prevalent. Uh, to increase investment and scale of what he calls, um, uh, what he calls SOP def defined, the standard operating procedure defined, socially franchised, quality assured, formal steps work int interventions. I think that's just a long way of saying good programs <laughs> that, 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 that are planned and monitored well. Uh, strengthen real-time real data use for continuous program refinement. Increase the focus on high transmission geographic areas and develop and evaluate effective interventions for hotspots and informal sex workers. So I think all these, all these things are needed and now we, we have these new HIV prevention technologies. I think they can do a much better, much better job even than we did before, um, but we need to reach the key population. So, so you know, pe pe people often will sort of will, will, will sort of accept that uh, lo that line of thinking about the importance of working with key populations in Asia. But 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 but, but, but the question is often asked: What about Africa, where the where the epidemics tend to be more more uh, more generalized, or there are more generalized epidemics? Uh, well, they're not all, but uh, there are, there are many generalized epidemics. This is a slide from uh, Steph uh, the publication of Steph Steph Burrell. I think, uh, I think Steph is here. He's uh, He's a Winnipegger, by the way. Just to get that get that in. Um, although he, he, although he's in the, he's he's, a, he's at Johns Hopkins now. This is a meta analysis of HIV prevalence studies among female sex workers in all all 
adult women in a number of African countries as well as, uh, as, well as India. And it, it just shows uh, this, this stark uh, difference between age play prevalence among female sex workers in the general population, differences of anywhere from two and a half fold to 54 fold, uh, two, two and a half fold in South Africa to 54 times the prevalence in India. Um, uh, so cl you know, clearly much higher risk for, the, for, these, for, these, uh, for these high risk populations. And uh, the percentage of women reporting commercial sex in these countries uh, is, is relatively high. This is an old study from uh, Michelle Cariel uh, from 20 years ago, but I don't think uh, our, our re more recent studies from Kenya have shown that it hasn't really changed much. At that time in Kenya, about 6% of the adult female population was felt to be engaged in, uh, in uh, commercial sex. Uh, and uh, some of the other countries range goes from anywhere from sort of 4% to over 10%. In, in spite of that, uh, some of the modes of these modes of transmission studies that have been done in African countries have shown that, um, uh, paradoxically, that uh, the, the, the distribution of HIV incident infections among these subgroups has not been that great. And the, these are data from three countries, Uganda, Kenya, and Nigeria. And you can see, um, I guess I can try to, I'll try to use this pointer. Um, you can see that, uh, I mean, these, these uh, I can only use the poker on, the, I can only use the pointer on one side though, so, so sorry for the people in the room. Uh, and these groups, IDUs, female sex workers, clients, and female sex workers, partners of clients, uh, only between around 10 and 20 percent, uh, depending on the country, were uh, shown to be the source of, or uh, of, of most of the, the seemed to be where the, mo where, the, where the incident cases w uh, were, were occurring. Um, and I think there were a couple of, uh, you know, Sharmis Demistra, who's also here from, from Toronto, but also is an honorary Winnipegger, uh, uh, has done a lot of work on lo looking at why this is the case. And I think there are some important issues which confound our understanding of HIV transmission dynamics. First of all, uh, there's been a gross underestimation of the size estimates of the both of the population of female sex workers, but especially the populations of clients. Uh, also underestimates probably of MSN and IDUs in many places. I'll, I'll just throw some data in a minute on that. But also some calculations, also um, calculations of the distribution of prevalent and, inc and incident HIV infections uh, in the short term, which is what this MOT uh, work really shows, can be very misleading in terms of HIV transmission dynamics and the upstream causes of infection. So someone who may be uh, been affected by their regular partner, their regular partner may have, may have been affected in the context of a, of a injection drug use or, or a commercial sex kind of, kind of uh, partnership. Um, so in um, uh, about three or four years ago, we did a national uh, estimate of uh, all key populations in Kenya, uh, female sex workers, men who have sex with men, and, uh, and people who inject drugs. Uh, in, in, in all the, uh, all the regions and all the urban centers within Kenya, and we found about, uh, we, we est our estimate was that about 138,000 or so women in, in Kenya were practicing sex work, which represents about 5% of the adult urban population. But in the demographic and health survey done in 2009, men reporting paying for sex were only about 218,000, about 2% 2 2 of male population. So clearly that doesn't make much sense. Uh, there wouldn't be much, uh, wouldn't be, wouldn't be much uh, income accruing from sex work if there were so few numbers of clients. It works out an average of only about 1.5 client per female sex worker per year, which is not much different from being married. Uh, and it would mean each client on average would have had have sex with a female, the same female sex worker 315 times per year, which is very unlikely. So I mean, clearly the client estimation is significantly low. And there's data now from, uh, this is data from Michelle Allery, who's um, from Quebec who's usually at these conferences, although he's, I think he's currently at a competing conference, uh, an STD conference in Marrakesh. Although why he would choose Marrakesh or Winnipeg, I don't know. But uh, I promised Pete Pope that I wouldn't say any, I wouldn't make any comments about Winnipeg winters or mosquitoes, so, so I won't. In any case, uh, data from uh, Benin and other countries uh, where, where, it was where, he where he and his colleagues looked at in West Africa showed that um, for example, in Benin, uh, the uh, 
the percent of the male population who reported visiting a female sex worker was 0.7 percent, but when data was collected by other means using polling booth surveys, which I don't have time to go into, but other ways where reporting is more anonymized and less stigmatized than a, than a physical interview, uh, it was actually 12 to 22 percent of the male population. So, so really an order of magnitude different. And the same, same is true in Burkina Faso, in Ghana, and in other countries. So there, there, there's been some renewed work uh, on, so on uh, trying, trying to uh, improve the MOT and uh, uh, so some modelers from London School and also from ISTA have been involved in that. And so, um, and so the, the, um, the, 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 the proportion of uh, uh, new HIV infections attributable to key populations now has, has gone up. From this is an example of Nigeria, originally 26%, and the, and the re revised estimate was 55%. And I think these as, as, as these estimates get more and more refined, I think this will continue to be borne out. Uh, again, Michelle Allery's group in West Africa looked at the population attributable fraction related to, uh, am among men, uh, related to contact, sexual contact with female sex workers, and found that, uh, for example, in Cotonou and Benin, 76% uh, of new infections were attributable to contact, sexual contact with a female sex worker. So clearly uh, important. And his program, which provided uh, uh, protection, HIV prevention, to female sex workers, both from acquiring infection, but also uh, from transmitting to others if they already had an infection, uh, it was estimated that that may have prevented 62% of new HIV infections among FSWs, but also 33% of new infections in the overall population. Um, Swaziland, uh, so th 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 those were largely still concentrated uh, ep epidemics. There isn't a lot of data on in this area from countries with generalized epidemics, but I, I tried to get some data from Swaziland, which is a small country in southern Africa, population only 1.1 million, so about the size of a small district, or even half a district in India. Uh, but ve very high HIV prevalence among adults, 20% in 2014. Hasn't uh, changed much in, in, in recent years. There's some, ins there's some evidence that incidence may be declining, but, uh, but it's still obviously a, a huge problem. Uh, in a study by Steph Burrell in 2014 and, and, and colleagues, uh, the HIV prevalence among a group of several hundred sex workers that they identified was 61 percent, so uh, you know, extremely high uh, prevalence of, of HIV. And only 40 percent of them were on treatment. So clearly, if any, gr if, if any group is important for a test and treat kind of strategy, this is one that needs to be reached, and, and, it's, not being, and it's not being reached in, a, in, a, in an adequate way. The government of Swaziland, uh, in, a, in, a, in a report of 2011, noted that 86% of female sex workers had been reached with HIV prevention program, programs, but they provided no mapping data, and I couldn't find any evidence of a mapping or numer enumeration exercise being done. And again, uh, uh, Steph and others uh, in, in, in their 2014 publication um, found that 40% of the sex workers they, uh, they interviewed uh, only 43% only reported a consistent condom use with new clients, and only 53% had received HIV prevention information related to sex work in the past year. So c clearly, I mean, there's been a lot of resources going into Swaziland for treatment, which is, which is, which is great, but it's, it's, it's shocking to me that after all these years in a country like Swaziland, they don't even know where the sex workers are or how many there are, uh, which, uh, and it's just impossible to, to, to obviously, to de design an effective prevention program um, uh, without that kind of knowledge. And in Kenya, we mapped all three of the, um, of the key population groups in a country of over 40 million in about three or four months. So you think that in Swaziland, you could, uh, with a population of one million, you could do it in a few weeks, I would think, but it's, it hasn't, doesn't seem to have been done. Uh, you, you, would you would think that with all, with the, uh, you know, with, well, with all this evidence for the importance of uh, key populations in uh, for uh, for HIV prevention, that uh, funding would, would you know funding would allocations would follow the same, uh, you know, the, you know would, would, would follow the evidence. But in fact, that's not true. Uh, this is another slide from Michelle Allery in Benin. So it shows us, for example, sex workers uh, in HIV prevalence of 26.5 percent, but only 0.6 percent of the national funding for HIV/AIDS is going towards uh, HIV prevention programs among, among sex workers. And that's not uh, atypical. 
in Ghana in 2010, only 0.8% of the HIV AIDS budget went for prevention programs among female sex workers and clients. Nigeria 2012, only 3.4% of the overall HIV AIDS budget for prevention among most at-risk populations. In Swaziland, which I mentioned, only 11.6% of the overall HIV AIDS budget was for prevention, any kind of prevention, and only 0.5% for programs for female sex workers and clients. And that's, that's actually 0.5% of the 11.6%, not 0.5% overall. So it's really a, really a minute amount. And that, that contrasts with India in 2011, where 67% of the overall HIV budget nationally was for prevention, and 20% of the overall, not 21% not of the 67, but 21% overall was for, was for prevention programs among key populations. And additionally, 17% of the overall budget was for condom procurement promotion and distribution, and most of that was for programs for, for key populations. So in India has, in, has invested heavily in prevention. They haven't neglected treatment. Uh, everybody in India gets free access to first-line antiretroviral medications if they're HIV positive, and the access to second-line treatment is also increasing. Um, you know, they're using a cutoff now of, of around 350, so the cost will go up when they move to 500, which they're planning to do soon, and to go to a test and treat kind of strategy, which I think will happen within the next few years, uh, that, you know, the, the treatment budget will, will continue, will, will increase, will, will continue to increase, but they've, but India has shown a commitment to still maintain the emphasis on, on, uh, maintain a strong emphasis on prevention. So to get back to my question, what about key populations in Africa? What about generalized epidemics? Uh, I would just draw your attention uh, to this um, paper by uh, Richard Steen and Patricia Wheeler in, in PLOS One. They, they, they put together a collection of articles um, in this uh, PLOS uh, supplement called Focus on Delivery and Scale, Achieving HIV Impact with Sex Workers. There are 18 articles in the collection. The website is there. I strongly recommend you having a look at that. And th the title of their editorial for these 18, uh, this collection of 18 articles was Feasible, Efficient, and Necessary Without Exception. Working with sex workers interrupts HIV STI transmission and brings treatment to many in need. And um, as, as they said, uh, I, you know, they said it better than I could, so I'm just quoting what, what they said in that editorial. Experience from Asia has demonstrated the feasibility of averting secondary transmission beyond sex workers and their clients by providing sex workers with HIV services. Feasibility and effectiveness have also been shown in Africa but funding for interventions in sex work remains marginal and large-scale responses are rare. So I, 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 I think in s even with these new HIV prevention technologies, if you don't make sure that, th that, uh, that uh, uh, individuals involved in sex work and other high-risk groups, men who have sex with men, injection drug users, are reached by these <coughs> prevention uh, programs, that the impact will continue to, to be marginal. So. Uh, Okay, that's, that's sort of off, I'm, I'm off my soapbox now. Uh, I'm gonna turn now very, very briefly to male circumcision. This has, this has nothing, nothing to do with key populations, but I'm up here and I have the mic and, uh, uh, and you're a captive audience, at least for another 10 minutes or so. So I'm just gonna uh, give, you, give, you, give you a little update on male circumcision. Five, five years ago, I gave the closing plenary at uh, CAR um, on, on male circumcision, and you know, by then the, uh, the, the three uh, RCTs in Africa had been uh, completed and the results went out for a few years. And the program, uh, program implementation uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in countries in Africa where, cir where circumcision was not practiced and where HIV prevalence was, was very high, uh, we're just starting, but there really wasn't much to say. So I just wanted to give a, an update on that. Uh, I, I showed this slide um, at that time, male circumcision, uh, probably the oldest and most prominent surgery performed. Th this, is, this is a, a hieroglyphic from an, ag an Egyptian tomb, uh, about 2600 BC. This is 600 years before the birth of Abraham when the, Jew when the Jewish people started to, uh, the ancient Jewish people started to circumcise. So it, it, was, it was long in practice in, 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 in Egypt. And uh, clearly it was done without anesthesia. This, this guy had to be restrained, it looks like. And they don't look very happy. I think we, we, we do it a lot better now. So, fla so flash for flash fast forwarding uh, 4,600 years, uh, so the, the, the wheels of public health grind slowly. Uh, 
these are the three trials that were uh, that were conducted uh, uh, in Uganda, Kenya, and uh, and South Africa. The South African study was also published in 2005, and the Uganda and Kenyan studies published in 2007. And uh, the, bo the bottom part of the slide shows the results of the so shows the results of the three studies. Th th remarkably similar re similar results among the three trials, even though the populations and the methodologies were were somewhat different. So about a 60, 55 to 60 percent uh, protective effect of male circumcision against HIV acquisition, which kind of mirrors the findings from previous uh, um, uh, observ observational studies. And th there, there have been at least uh, three meta-analyses done uh, uh, on this work, which may seem a bit over the top, because the it's, it's clear if you did a, I mean, the, these results are so similar that it it's, it's hard to imagine that a meta-analysis which combines them all would show anything different, and of course they didn't. Uh, the confidence intervals were a little bit narrower, but I, you know it's important to have publications, and it improves my H index as well. So I think that's okay. Um, and th th this is data from our, our trial in Kenya, which shows that uh, uh, you know our our, our th the study was, was was only went through two years. It was stopped. It was stopped even before two years, but we did follow people for several years uh, beyond the end of the trial because not it we, although circumcision was offered to everybody in the control group, only about half of the men in the control group opted for circumcision. And if you look at HIV incidents, uh, comparing the, those who were circumcised versus uncircumcised, this, this uh, difference uh, uh, continued and in, in, in fact increased in magnitude over time. So as a result, uh, in 2007, WHO UNA uh, published their, uh, uh, the results of a consultation that ma male circumcision should be recognized as an efficacious intervention for HIV prevention and it should be promoted uh, in, c in certain contexts. Uh, so at, at, that, at that time, a few years ago, uh, this clearinghouse was developed on, ma on male circumcision uh, and it's, it's, it's still on that website, which I, which I recommend. But back in, um, you know, back in 2011, program scale up was really just starting so only about 1.5 mi uh, million uh, men had been circumcised uh, in, 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 the, in the four or five years since program began in these 14 countries in eastern and southern Africa where uh, circumcision was was being promoted but over the course of um, over the course of the years by you know, in two th 2012 was up to three million it doubled uh, doubled in 2013 to 6 million, increased to 9, 9 million in 2014, uh, o over 10 million last year, probably close to 11 or 12 million uh, now. So there's been a, been a tremendous scale up really, which, is, which I had not anticipated and which is really, really qu I think quite, uh, quite remarkable. Uh, you, pr you, can't, you probably can't see all the numbers in this slide, but some, many of the countries have already reached their target in terms of circumcising uh, uh, over 80 percent of the male population. Kenya is, is, is there, Ethiopia is there, uh, Tanzania is there, all, all, all almost reached its target. Um, those, c those countries though, they, uh, o only parts of the populations in those countries don't practice circumcision traditionally. But even in some countries like Uganda where circumcision is universally not practiced, they're up to about 50 percent now of uh, of all adult men uh, being circumcised, and that, that translates into over two million, um, two million men. And overall, uh, about nine million people, s uh, nine million men circumcised over the past six years or so, which, which is about 44% of the target. And that's continued to increase. I think it's likely that the target will be reached within the next few years. Uh, and just to remind you, s uh, some modeling estimates, uh, that universal male circumcision across these 14 countries uh, could prevent as many as 6 million HIV infections and 3 million deaths over 20 years. So I think we're, we're, we're close to halfway there. So I think we, you know, we, can, we can estimate that probably 3 million HIV infections are being prevented through these programs. It's important though to remember that um, it, it, it takes time. This is a modeling that we did uh, several years ago for a country like Botswana. Uh, we, which, which went from about, and we modeled it going from about 10% to 80% circumcision. Botswana is now at about 50%, so it still hasn't reached 80%. But even at 80%, it takes about 10 years or so b 
for an effect on overall HL prevalence is, is going to be observed. So I think, I think we're still uh, waiting to observe the effect. Um, modeling studies that have been done show that the, the effect should be there, but we, will be, we won't have really empirical results uh, for, for, for a few years yet. And just finally, just uh, I think I still show this slide back then as well. This is a um, this is a, a circ leaps. Uh, there, 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 there are a number of organizations that are strongly anti-circumcision. Most of them were in the U.S. A lot of them in California. I think there are about 200 discrete uh, anti-circumcision organizations in California, and uh, they all they all they, they have this website, uh, which is kind of an outing website for um, people who uh, support male circumcision. And uh, you know, back five 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 years ago. Uh, you know, I was a bit I was a bit concerned that I was on the list, but when I saw that people like uh, Stephen Lewis and Bill Clinton and Bill Gates were on the list and Oprah Winfrey, okay, uh, I didn't think that was such a bad thing. But uh, I looked at it again recently, and the, the list has expanded. So this outing website now they're now they're, they're now outing about eighty three people, I think. Um, so it's expanded, but I it was I was really interested to see that the new that that. This updated list includes uh, Alicia Keys, Annie Lennox, and Bono. So uh, this is this is clearly the best list that I'm ever going to be on. <laughs> so I think I think it's that, that's I think that's a good note on which to end this talk. Maybe a good note on which to retire. And uh, I'd just like to acknowledge and thank all the people who've contributed data and ideas to this talk. And thank you all for paying attention. Hi, I'm Mark Weinberg, and uh, bonjour, bonsoir à tous et à toutes. Ça me donne grand plaisir de remercier uh, Dr. Stephen Moses pour cette exposition extraordinaire. Thank you, Stephen, for your, your great talk. And mostly, I again want to thank Carr for really um, this wonderful honor of having bestowed on me uh, this lectureship, so to speak, that is delivered annually by somebody who exemplifies uh, excellence in Canadian HIV science. Um, so, you know, it's, it's great for me to be here with you at another um, Mark Weinberg pre-memorial lecture. Um, I see you've got that um, new photo of me up on, on the slide. Um, and every year, you know, I kind of get two minutes or so. They tell me to speak for 90 minutes, but I really don't want to take up that much time. Um, and, and I guess this has turned into my stand-up comedy routine, so to speak. But um, I was really concerned um, because rumor had had it that this year's choice for this uh, lectureship um, w was actually going to be uh, Donald Trump. Um, and, you know, I, I was a little bit worried. Um, rumors started to spread, and uh, when I heard that he was being seriously considered by the program committee. Um, yeah, I'm not the kind of person who ever intervenes, but I, I think that Stephen uh, did a, a, a wonderful job. Um, you know, the other Moses um, took 40 years to lead his people to the promised land. And when it comes to HIV prevention, um, I'll tell you, I hope that 40 years from now, we will no longer have an HIV epidemic and I hope that I will be able to stand here in front of all of you 40 years from now and say how great it is that we brought an end to, to HIV. Um, so uh, let me uh, just tell Stephen, uh, who did such wonderful work uh, in the area of circumcision and, and prevention, as well as other areas of prevention. Um, my colleague at McGill, uh, Margaret Somerville, had to switch fields um, away from being an anti-circumcision advocate when the scientific data became very clear uh, that circumcision did in fact play a preventive role in regard to HIV uh, spread. Um, so now she's gone on to uh, join advocates who um, try to advocate against vaccination uh, because in perhaps some people's mind that's also a, a case worth making. I, I feel um, very sad about this. Um, and, you know, I, I do have to say um, 
that uh, when it comes to HIV, you know, w let's face it, we have a, a tough sell. Uh, the population at large thinks that we have done such a great job that this is no longer an important area of investigation. We all know that that is not true. But the world at large, in terms of people who vote, don't have that perspective. Um, you know, I in a sort of um, semi-serious way, um, the Zika epidemic, which is awfully scary, um, it really is, and deserves funding and support in terms of dealing with what is shaping up to be a major, major public health problem, um, is turning out to be multifactorial, right? Not only is it mosquito transmitted, but Zika can also be sexually transmitted. I, I think we should, some of us, think about branching out into the Zika field because, after all, who knows more about sex than us? So um, I also want to apologize. Uh, Julio Montaner could not be here because the Premier of British Columbia was not available to get on a plane with him. Um, and, um, y you know, um, I, I hope that this lectureship doesn't turn into something that we'll consider to be Ken's folly um, as my one-liners fall flat. Um, be and I want to tell you why that is. Uh, you know, I used to have really good jokes, but, um, you know, my team of writers uh, is no longer being subsidized adequately by the car budget. So, um, you know, maybe recognize that they deserve an inflationary increase or, or something, that, that would be great. Um, so um, with that, I think I'll uh, just say um, merci beaucoup à tous. And thank you for your attention. Mark, your jokes are actually better than ever. I love Julio jokes. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Mark, and uh, congratulations, Stephen. Uh, well deserved. Um, it's now my pleasure to um, uh, to introduce the uh, Red Ribbon Award. Um, so, what is the Red Ribbon Award? It was established in 2001, and it's presented annually by CAR for outstanding service to the cause of research in a way that has increased our understanding of treatment and prevention of HIV/AIDS, while enhancing the quality of life of those who live with this disease. Um, and it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about the winner this year, who's Margaret Orman. <laughs> so get comfortable, Margaret, because I've got a lot to say. Um, my comments aren't uh, just my own. Um, they were compiled from a number of different people um, throughout, uh, um, throughout the, the city of Winnipeg and uh, across the country um, who provided uh, comments. Um, so I'd like to thank them for their contributions. Um, so Margaret Orman is a fixture and a pioneer in the HIV scene in Winnipeg. She works as a research nurse for many studies at the University of Manitoba, and she's the executive director of Sunshine House, which is a community drop-in and resource center focusing on harm reduction, population health promotion, uh, and social inclusion. And Margaret also worked at various nursing stations in northern Manitoba, and many, many other things that, um, um, that she does as well. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about Margaret, the researcher. So HIV tends to affect those members of our society who are most vulnerable and most marginalized such as sex workers, injection drug users, street-involved youth, just to name a few. It's members of these populations who appear invisible to many in our society, but not to Margaret. 
Margaret's gift is her ability to see past external appearances and see the inner value in each of us, even researchers. When Margaret interviews a sex worker or a drug injection user for a research study, she's not interviewing them, she's visiting with them. She enters their house as a guest, she shares some tea with them, and they have a conversation. She listens to them. Margaret always takes the time to listen to people's stories, and the questions on research surveys actually benefit gr gr a great deal from Margaret's approach, and the value of the research generated is improved because of Margaret's approach. What about Margaret, the, the, the student, or Margaret, the mentor? Um, Margaret is also a community uh, mentor for graduate students at the University of Manitoba, um, including one of my own. She's taken graduate students and many academic members, including myself, under her wing and showed them that research in highly vulnerable populations is scientifically important, that these populations um, should not be overlooked, uh, and how community-engaged research should be done in a respectful and meaning meaningful manner. <coughs> She's taught me that people are interested in what is happening at a basic level um, to the virus and the molecular cell level. It's my job as a researcher to communicate that without all that fancy jargon nonsense, she always tells me. Um, Margaret is a tireless advocate for research and how it should be done properly and how important it is to address the issues of relevance to those living with HIV in our communities. Many researchers are engaged in studies that are much more relevant to the community and much more effective because of Margaret's involvement. Margaret is also never afraid to not only be the mentor, but also to learn new things and be the student. She's been a member of the University Without Walls, which was in a, a very intensive learning environment, and she was very engaged in that. And I had the pleasure of going to India with Margaret as part of our uh, International Infectious Disease Training Program, um, where we did a program, uh, a, a course in pro program science. Um, Margaret leapt into a group assignment on geographic information systems with both feet. Um, so if anyone needs any advice on GIS sy systems integrations, Margaret is your lady. Um, she said she hated it, but she actually didn't hate it all that much, and she did a very great job. Um, however, um, like a compass, Margaret was always there to draw the conversation um, and point it back to reality when some of the discussions got a little bit too theoretical. So she was very much grounded the whole uh, uh, discussion. But I think most importantly, Margaret um, is an organizer. Uh, for almost 30 years, Margaret has been an outstanding community leader working with hi highly vulnerable populations, many of them street involved. In particular, she was an early leader in working with people living with HIV AIDS, particularly those from disadvantaged communities, and helped establish Kali Shiva AIDS service AIDS services, which among other things in the late 80s and 90s, provided hospice care to those dying of AIDS who had nowhere else to turn. She's admir admirably continued um, that work to this very present day and her strong commitment and dedication to people living with HIV continues. As the director of the Sunshine House, Margaret has, um, has, uh, has been exceedingly innovative in the programs that, that have been developed there. As an example, the Solvent Users Recreation Project saw street-involved people become involved with fun activities that allowed them to engage socially, learn new skills, and have a sense of purpose. Activities included artwork, drum making, home repair, autom automotive mechanics, boxing, photography, bicycle repair, and music. And actually, the Sunshine House Band, which uh, was an offshoot of that, uh, has generated original tunes, co-written by the program participants and produced a CD. And actually, they're gonna be performing at uh, this year's uh, gala, car gala uh, event, so you get to see them in person. There's also been uh, innovative ideas, such as Drag Queen Taco Delivery Service, um, which is a fundraiser for Sunshine House. Um, these innovative programs show how Margaret's creativity can create opportunities for health and personal growth in fun, engaging, and non-judgmental ways. It is Margaret's energy and positive spirit that breaks down barriers and brings people together to do these new and amazing things. Margaret has helped develop community outreach programs at Nine Circles Community Health Center, 
um, which is the Maine Community HIV Care Clinic in Manitoba. Her involvement in developing the programs and supporting the training and outreach team was instrumental in the early success of those programs. Margaret's true gift or talent is empathy, an ability to make meaningful connections to so many members of our society that are all too easily ignored. And that gift is really where her leadership lies. She leads by showing, by showing others and constantly reminding us that we can't forget about the sex worker standing on Higgins or the solvent users struggling to stay warm under the Osborne Bridge. These are people with problems that many in society can't imagine, let alone deal with. Margaret's leadership, uh, uh, without Margaret's leadership, all of these individuals would be a little bit further removed from us. Margaret is a tireless advocate for our highly vulnerable populations, especially those living and at risk for HIV. She, she, she's a real bridge between the academic research world and the real world where people live with real challenges. Margaret is an optimist who believes all people deserve to be respected and cared about. It is through her creativity and energy that she brings people from all walks of life together to work for a common goal that benefits all of us. Her passion and altruism is only matched by her cheek, her foul mouth, and her total disregard for established norms. Her attitude is, I don't care what they think. This is important, and we're going to do it. So I don't know who they is, but they is always getting shit from Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> and we love her for that attitude. Um, above all else, the Red Ribbon Award recognizes those who work to improve the lives of those living with HIV AIDS. Margaret certainly has done this on many levels for many years. Margaret hates being the center of attention and will be the first to tell you that she didn't do any of this alone and that everyone else deserves all the credit and not her. Don't believe a word of it. It is her energy, her creativity, and her stubbornness that rallies others around. The result is that together they make a real difference in people's lives. Therefore, on behalf of CAR, we're very pleased that Margaret Orman is this year's 2016 Red Ribbon Award winner. I really do think they should get a tiara. I thought this was coming with a tiara. Apparently not. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge also, uh, as did uh, uh, Marissa and um, Ken, uh, that we are on Treaty 1 territory, and this is the homeland of the Métis Nation. It is also Manitoba Day, and IMAC is still occupied. I'd like to thank Carr for this astounding award. I am uh, in the company of giants, the Portland Hotel Society, Katie, Alan Ronald, David Ho, Louise Binder, and many others, people and organizations that cut a raging swath through the complex world of HIV since the late 80s and continue to impact the tone and the scope of the work in many displays. The work that's been undertaken here by comparison has a very small reach. I've been in, in amazing places. I've been along Main Street in Winnipeg and all over the North End. I've been in the Karnataka region of southern U India, thanks to the generosity of people like Stephen Moser. I've been in China, in Colombia, and I've learned the mechanic and language of research from brilliant people, and the art of generosity from poor people who have stories and jokes to share. From their experience, I was able to comprehend the specific lexicons, lexicons of various disciplines so that I could use and possibly abuse them 
with and the four people that I have worked with in a way that let them in on scientific secrets. Because of this, it seems that nominating me for this very prestigious award is an act in itself of extreme audacity. I have what I call Rex Murphy days. On those days, I talk in circles. I think like a reactionary. I even look like Rex Murphy. <laughs> Comments that about HIV being a, a chronic manageable disease that do not ring true for many of the people that I know. Comments about the justice in the justice system that does not bring justice to people who are sexually assaulted. But I've learned to keep to myself on those days. There are other days when I'm delighted. When a crew or research cohort is invited to a lab to see for themselves exactly what will happen to the, to the samples they provide to research and return to Sunshine House ready, willing, and informed about microbial translocation among solvent users. I know also that some researchers understand that ethics goes beyond research ethics boards into the everyday ethics that govern communities, allowing them to participate as full citizens. I have been allowed and encouraged to ask young, young people to tell me about dirt in research about STDs and to answer the question, what's going on with reference to their intimate lives? I'm delighted that friends, among them my friend John, who still studies the ecosystem of vaginas and that he is a furious feminist, and that drag queens from the Like That program disrupted many bureaucracies delivering tackles in April and that JB and the Sunshine Band, a mashup as Winnipeg as Slurpees in January, who make songs out of stupid jokes, will entertain you at the gala. A friend of uh, the family, my family, some of my sister hears, they didn't, I didn't have to give them money or anything to come. <laughs> but a friend of the family once said that the Ormond family motto should be Leave no bridge unburned. <laughs> My son Luke, who is half of the band called White Horse, called their last album Leave No Bridge Unburned. And in April, they won a Juno. <laughs> and here I am with you in this place, insisting on placing history into mapping, haranguing that silence should be considered a mode of literacy, talking dirty, rejecting research that tinkers with lies, and burning down bridges. Someone here made the nomination, so it really is your fault. I do thank you, though, and I do thank all of you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks very much, Margaret, and congratulations again. So we are uh, just a few minutes away from wrapping up. We've got a couple of housekeeping uh, issues that we need to let you know about. Uh, so the first is that you can download the mobile app for the CAR program for your phone. We also will have internet access uh, throughout the convention center, and all the details are listed there.
space. Just to remind you that the uh, gala event is at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. And when we were initially thinking about where we were going to have the, uh, the gala, to be honest, we were a little bit nervous about having it at the Human Rights Museum because it seems like a very serious place. Uh, but we went there and found out that it's, um, it does address a number of very serious human rights issues over the past and brings, uh, brings them to light. But it's also a place to celebrate, to celebrate the great advances in human rights that have been made. And there's weddings held there, and it's a great place to party, and you're really going to enjoy it. Um, I just uh, uh, remind you that the Sunshine House Band is going to be performing, so get there early for that. Um, and also you get to view, uh, go around and see some of the galleries, um, but that's only until 9 o'clock, so um, make sure that you get there in time to enjoy the, the gallery. Um, the poster and exhibit viewing time are going to be uh, displayed up there, so please take note of that. Um, and uh, right now we're going to move on to the uh, opening reception, which is at uh, room 2H, which is that uh, out this door and then up to the uh, top of the second um, escalator. Um, so that's the end of the uh, opening ceremonies. Thank you for your, uh, for your attention and patience, and let's go have a drink. Thank you.